American government, limited government. In the words of John Adams, the nation's second president, the Constitution was designed to create, quote, a government of laws rather than a government of men. The nation's highest authority will be contained in a document rather than the dictates of a ruler, no matter how convenient or popular those dictates may be. Today we take these ideas for granted, but in 1787 when the Constitution was written, these were revolutionary ideas indeed. Elsewhere in the world, the law was what the king said was the law. His word was law. America would be governed instead by a constitution that put limits on what those in power could actually do. Why were the framers of the constitution determined to limit the power of their government? How did they build the concept of limited government into the constitution? And has the U.S. Constitution actually served as an effective check against expansive power? The American Revolution was fought to overthrow what the Declaration of Independence called the absolute tyranny of the king. Still, the framers worried that the United States government uh, their revolution gave birth to might itself one day become a tyrannical itself. Benjamin Franklin was famously asked by a woman what type of government he and his delegates had, uh, at the convention had created. He yelled back at her, a republic, ma'am, if you can keep it. When the American states declared their independence from Britain, they had originally written a constitution called the Articles of Confederation. The Articles established a national government, but gave it almost no authority or powers. They had no power to tax. They said had to petition states for money. States were slow to pay and often paid the treasury less than their pledge there. Think about your own finances. What do you do when you're short on money? Probably cut back on spending. You have to. If you get desperate, you might try to sell some of your valuables to friends or the pawn shop. And that's exactly what the government of the Articles did. To save money, it slashed the army to less than 1,000 men. To raise money, it sold Navy ships to foreign powers. And it's still at a time when Britain had a large uh, army in Canada and Spain had one in what is now Florida. How would the country defend itself if attacked by Britain or Spain? George Washington, the father of the United States, worried that the U.S. would descend into chaos under the Articles, opening the door to a tyrannical despot. The Constitution was meant to resolve the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation, but the writers were also determined that the new government should not be so strong as to threaten foundational liberty. So their strategy was to grant the national government necessary powers, including the power to tax, while at the same time placing strict limits upon its authority. The strategy included denials of power. Government officials would be prohibited, for example, from putting someone in prison unjustly. Doing so was obviously unjust, but it was a common practice across Europe at the time. Opponents of European kings were often falsely charged for crimes they did not commit and locked away for as long as was desired by the king, until death in many cases. Such practices would forever be prohibited in the United States. The U.S. Constitution gives those accused of crimes the right to appear before an independent judge who determines whether authorities have enough evidence to warrant detention and trial. The writers also sought to limit government through grants of power. Grants of power. Article 1, the first article of the United States Constitution gives Congress 17 specific powers, such as the power to tax, the power to raise an army and navy, the power to coin money, the power to regulate uh, regular commerce, etc. These, these grants give power, but they also deny power. Powers not granted to Congress, those not in that list, are denied to it. In a period of history when other governments admitted to no limits on power, this was a, uh, this was a substantial limitation. As originally written, the U.S. Constitution did not include a Bill of Rights, a list of specific individual rights, such as freedom of speech. Many young people don't know this. Uh, the framers thought a list was unnecessary because the government had only those powers granted to it, and it had not been granted the power to deny people rights. Thomas Jefferson was among the many who thought otherwise. Jefferson had included a Bill of Rights in the Virginia Constitution he wrote at the outset of the Revolutionary War. And other states had followed his example. Said Jefferson, quote, The Bill of Rights is what the people are entitled to against every government on earth. In response to such, a, such objections, the first Congress passed a series of amendments that were quickly ratified by the states at the behest of the old anti-federalists. The original Constitution does not have the Bill of Rights. Those are the first of ten amendments made during the first Congress. These amendments, the first ten to the Constitution, are commonly called the Bill of Rights. They were not included in the Constitution upon ratification, but they were insisted upon by those anti-federalists who were very skeptical of the new Constitution's broad national powers. Let us briefly review them. The First Amendment to the United States Constitution offers multiple protections, the right to exchange ideas through speech and through the press, media, 
freedom to practice the religion of your choice, freedom to gather with a group to protest or for other reasons, and the right to call the government's attention to perceived injustices, i.e. through the courts. The Second Amendment is the great equalizer in that it protects the fundamental right to keep and bear firearms. Third Amendment denies government the ability to force homeowners to take in soldiers during times of war. Before the Revolutionary War, laws gave British soldiers the right to take over uh, private American homes in aid of their military efforts. The Fourth Amendment bars the government from conducting unreasonable searches and seizures of an individual or their private property or possessions, their home, their car, their pockets, even their cell phones. The Fifth Amendment provides several protections for people accused of crimes. The amendment states that serious criminal charges must be uh, started by a grand jury. A person cannot be tried twice for the same offense. It's called double jeopardy, and you can't do it in the United States. You don't... People cannot have their property taken away without just compensation. People have the right against self-incrimination and cannot be imprisoned without due process of law. Basically, it encapsulates fair procedures of, uh, of a trial. The Sixth Amendment provides additional protection to people accused of crimes, such as the right to a speedy and public trial trial by an impartial jury of their peers in criminal cases, and the right to be informed of criminal charges made against you. Witnesses must face the accused, and the accused is allowed his or her own witnesses and to be represented by a lawyer. The Seventh Amendment extends the right to a jury trial in federal civil cases. The Eighth Amendment bars excessive bail for the accused and bars fines and cruel and unusual punishment for those found guilty of, of violating the law. The Ninth Amendment explains the, that listing specific rights in the Constitution, Amendments 1 through 8, for example, does not mean that the people do not have other rights uh, that have not been spelled out. This was a concern put out by the Federalists. If you name the rights, people might read the Constitution like that's the only rights that are protected. This amendment uh, makes that clear that that's not the case. Similarly, the Tenth Amendment clarifies that the federal government has only those powers delegated to it in the Constitution. If it is not listed in the Constitution, it belongs to the states or to the people. It cannot be claimed by agents of the federal government. By enumerating some very important rights, the framers made clear with the Ninth and Tenth Amendments that they were not listing all of the fundamental rights held by the people or the states within the Constitution. The Bill of Rights stands as a crystal clear example of efforts to ensure a limited American government by America's founders. If you're arrested tomorrow and you had no money, the judge is compelled by law to ensure that you are able to acquire adequate legal representation in court. The government is required by the court's interpretation of the Sixth Amendment to provide you a lawyer if you cannot afford one. Explicit protections to enable citizens to protect themselves from inevitable government overreach were added to the Constitution via these Bill of Rights. The framers knew that words alone, written grants and denials would not be enough to control those in power. Men are not angels. So they divided their new government into separate branches and pitted them against one another. This was not a new idea. French theorist Montesquieu had proposed it nearly a century earlier. He said, where there is no separation of powers, there can be no liberty. But the framers added something new to the theory. Rather than completely separating the branches as Montesquieu had proposed, they overlapped them so that each was positioned to act as a check against the others. Checks and balances. So instead of granting all legislative power to Congress, they gave some of it to the president, for example, the power to veto laws written by Congress, and some of it to the courts, the power to interpret laws passed by Congress to measure their constitutionality. Same is true with executive power, though, office of the president. The president has most, but not all of it. Congress controls how much money the president can spend and on what. The president is commander-in-chief of the armed forces, but only Congress can formally declare war. The framers did the same with judicial power. The Constitution gives the president the power to nominate federal judges, but gives the Senate the responsibility to confirm those nominees. Federal judges can be removed from the bench, but only if both houses of Congress coordinate on an impeachment and conviction for that judge. The Supreme Court can declare a law unconstitutional, but the Constitution itself can be amended by the states or by Congress to circumvent such a ruling. The system of divided powers can be described as separate institutions sharing power. The powers of government legislative, executive, and judicial, are granted to the separate branches. No branch has total power within its domain of authority. Part of its power is shared with the other two branches, providing them a means of checking that branch's power. So as the framers' theory of governance stood the test of time, certainly not in all cases. After Japan attacked U.S. forces at Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt 
ordered the forced relocation of more than 100,000 Japanese Americans into internment camps based on the fear that they might try to help America's enemy. He did so through executive order or presidential edict. These Americans were forced to sell their homes or were sent by bus to deten uh, detention camps in Utah and other inland states far from where they're living. They lived out the war years behind barbed wire and rudimentary accommodations and were watched over by armed guards. Their advocates looked to Congress for help, but Congress failed to stand up to the executive branch. Not a single senator or House member moved to rescind that executive order. Three times, the U.S. Supreme Court reviewed the policy each time, including Korematsu versus the United States. The court held that compulsory exclusion of citizens during times of war is justified in order to reduce the risk of espionage. The act was clearly unconstitutional by FDR, however. Ironically, Japanese Americans were allowed during World War II to volunteer for combat in Europe. They made up the entirety of the U.S. Army's 442nd Regiment. That regiment, uh, regiment became the most decorated combat unit of its size, uh, not only in World War II, but in the whole of U.S. military history. 21 of its soldiers received the Congressional Medal of Honor, the nation's highest award. For 40 years later, during the uh, Ronald Reagan administration, the United States formally issued an apology for its mistreatment of Japanese Americans, saying that it was a result of race, prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. Japanese internment represents a collective failure to live up to the ideals of the Constitution that cut across all branches of the government. Executive, congressional, and judicial. As the relocation policy indicates, America is not a stranger to tyranny, the powerful trampling on the rights of the weak. Such episodes, thankfully, have been relatively few in number. And the system of checks and balances enacted by the Constitution is of reason. In both small and headline-making ways, the President, Congress, and the Supreme Court regularly intervene when the other branches overstep its constitutional authority. The Watergate scandal is a textbook example of how divided powers can work. On June 9, 1972, a security guard at the Watergate buildings in Washington, D.C. noticed that the latch on the door to the Democratic Party's national headquarters had been taped open. The police who arrived caught five men inside installing wiretap bugs in the phones and in the ceilings. It turned out these men had indirect links to President Richard Nixon's re-election campaign in 1972. Nixon denied that anyone at the White House had knowledge of the break-in. In truth, the Watergate break-in was part of a much larger political campaign aimed at securing Nixon's re-election. The so-called dirty tricks employed by the re-election effort included wiretaps, tax audits, burglaries of Nixon's opponents, paid in part with money laundered through Mexico. The turning point in the Watergate scandal occurred when, during a Senate investigative hearing, a White House assistant revealed that Nixon had recorded all of his Oval Office conversations on tape. Nixon at first refused Congress's demand to hear the tapes. As public pressure mounted, he released transcripts of what he claimed were all the relevant ones. When Congress demanded more tape material, Nixon refused. Congress then filed suit to get the tapes. In a unanimous decision, the U.S. Supreme Court, including four Nixon appointees to the bench, ordered Nixon to turn over those tapes. And those tapes were incriminating. Nixon was heard telling his assistants to cover up the Watergate break-in, including using the CIA to block the FBI from investigating the incident. The House of Representatives immediately began impeachment hearings against the president in accordance with the procedure for removing the president from office laid out in the Constitution. Nixon famously resigned rather than being prosecuted by Congress. He gave his peace signs and got in the helicopter and left. President Nixon, despite holding what is often thought of as the most powerful position on earth, was powerless to stop Congress and the Supreme Court from holding him to account for his actions, thanks to the authors of the United States Constitution. America's system of checks and balances doesn't always operate that decisively, however. Politics is a rough and sometimes deceitful game. What if the Watergate bur burglars had not been so stupid as to get caught? Would Nixon's illegal action have been discovered in time to do anything meaningful about it? Presidential secrecy is a clear weakness as it relates to the effectiveness of America's system of checks and balances. In contrast, congressional secrecy is not a problem. Congress has 535 members, 100 in the Senate and 435 across the states. It couldn't keep a secret if it tried. The presidency is different. Presidents can command the loyalty of their close assistants and can sometimes withhold potentially important information, at least for a while, if it is willing to accept the risks that come with silence, duplicity, or deceit of the public. Divided government alone is not enough to protect liberty and the rule of law when leaders with poor character are elected by the people. A different type of threat to limited government is illustrated by the aforementioned detention of Japanese Americans during World War II. In that case, all three branches thought a clear 
breach of the Constitution serve the nation's interests in a frightening time of war. If all three branches decide collectively to defy the Constitution, there's little that can be done by the people to rectify the situation in the near term. Only the next election gives them recourse. This type of tyranny of the majority remains a threat today, which should disabuse arguments that divided government and political gridlock are somehow a critical problem in the 21st century. I believe the opposite is very true. Gridlock, periods of time when it seems like the government can't accomplish anything, stops us from elevating short-term policy concerns above longer-term ones. Division and debate keep government from abusing those who may find themselves in the minority position on a given issue. Contrary to growing opinion, gridlock itself is not a problem to be solved by amending long-standing rules. It is evidence of a lack of imperative for Congress to actually do anything. When the smoke detector is going off, you don't pull out the battery. You find out where the smoke is coming from. But I digress. There's yet another threat to our system of limited government that has grown more dangerous in the past few decades. That is politics itself. Such dangers were illustrated uh, in my youth in the Bush administration's anti-terrorism policies of the early 2000s. The September 11, 2001 terror attacks convinced the Bush administration and the majority of Americans that a global war on terrorism would require the nation to adopt a new set of rules. The rules for handling enemy captives were hatched in secrecy to keep them from scrutiny by Congress. They were also kept secret from those in the administration itself, including Secretary, uh, Secretary of State uh, General Colin Powell, who would have likely objected to some of those rules. Slowly, information and photographs surrounding the treatment of enemy combatants leaked out, in some instances through the media, in other instances through legal cases being argued in federal courts. Young people like me joined anti-war protests at home and in Washington. We were in the extreme minority at the time, but through constitutionally protected discussion, protest, and debate, more and more Americans eventually came to oppose such anti-terror policies, and eventually, a clear majority of Americans turned against the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq that they had initially supported thanks to the First Amendment. As more information came out and protests grew, there were calls for congressional hearings into the constitutionality of some of the administration's secretive anti-terror policies, but almost none were held. Even Supreme Court rulings in 2004 and 2006 against Bush administration terror policies did not prompt Congress to launch investigative hearings. Then, in 2007, the number of congressional hearings increased dramatically on the topic. As you might have guessed, the reason boiled down to politics. In 2006, Republicans controlled the House and Senate, and thereby controlled the scheduling of hearings. <clears throat> they were not at all interested in holding a Republican administration to account for its policies, anticipating how harmful this would be politically. Things changed abruptly after Democrats swept the 2006 congressional elections and took control of the House and Senate in early 2007. The Democrats now controlled the hearing process, seeking their own partisan advantage ahead of the 2008 general election. Democrats were keen to grill the Bush administration on its war policies at every opportunity. As we noted, the Constitution was designed to provide for limited government, meaning a government not so powerful as to threaten individual liberty. The Constitution contains various controls on government, including grants of power and denials of power. However, the key mechanism is the separation of powers between the three branches. The powers of the branches are overlapped so that each branch can more effectively act as a check against the others. This system includes variables that simply cannot be accounted for and relies on the character of the citizenry and its leaders to operate effectively. It weakens when the three branches are united in thinking that the national interest is served by ignoring the Constitution. It weakens when a president succeeds, even for a time to keep unlawful action secret. And it weakens when the presidency, Congress, and judiciary are controlled by the same party, are beholden to the same ideology, are united in a shared quest to squander American blood and treasure for political gains or collectively fail to account for the perspectives of those holding different positions. Although the U.S. system is not a perfect check on the human impulse to secure power, the record also shows that on many occasions our system has helped rein in and prevent more serious abuses of power. The fact that so many of our leaders have tried to operate outside the law suggests they would have done so more readily and more outrageously if the other branches had been powerless to check their actions. To strip our nation of intentionally anti-democratic protections, like the Electoral College, like the Senate filibuster, or suggestions today that we should pack the Supreme Court with more justices in order to short-circuit our federal system, efforts like these to secure policy gains today would further weaken our system of limited government and would leave us prone to unimaginable abuses of government power in the future. No short-term policy gain would be worth that risk, but I digress. There was a great deal of wisdom in what John Adams once said in a letter to Thomas Jefferson. I say that power must never be trusted without a check. 